If you want to take your Bibles, turn with me to Joshua chapter 6 as uh, we continue to look at the life of Joshua. And he was a man who was, was fearless. We're going to be looking this year at different men and women, looking at their lives, how they handled situations, how they approached God, how they were able to be fearless in their faith. And we're kind of coming towards the end of, of this section in this life, in this man whose name is Joshua. I want to just start the message this morning with a statement. And we're going to we're going to kind of glide through the whole message, but this statement rings true, which is this. God desires for us to know victory. Do you believe that? God desires for us to know victory. But in order to know victory, we have to understand how to get there. Now, it doesn't matter how accurate you are if you're aiming at the wrong target. Right? You can say, I, I, I'm, I'm accurate, I never miss, but if you're not aiming at the right target, what's going to happen? You're going to miss. Correct? And so this, we want to understand faith. We want to understand how to be fearless in faith, especially when we're facing obstacles that seem ominous, that, that, seem, that seems like we cannot tackle it it's too big for us the picture that we have of 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 bailey looking into the ocean sometimes when i look at that picture and i think about different times in my life i feel that way i i know what god wants from me this year i know what he wants to do in me to make me fearless in my faith and sometimes when I think about it it seems overwhelming and that's exactly how I feel but I know that God is with me I know that God is for me I know that God is not going to forsake me and that's why our theme this year is Isaiah 41 10 fear not for I am with you do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And as I was thinking about this and thinking about Joshua chapter 6, I read over and over again John chapter 14. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I just want to hit some scriptures for you to help put all this in context. First one says, let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Truly, truly, I say to you, verse 12, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I did and greater works than these you will do because I am going to go to the Father. And then in verse 16, it says, ask and I will ask the Father. And he will give you another helper. What's that talking about? The Holy Spirit. Who today, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that the Spirit of God dwells in us. He directs us. He helps us. He helps us see that target, that bullseye. And he doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. And he keeps our focus on him. So Jesus says, I will give you another helper to be with you forever. So this morning as we take a look at Joshua chapter 6, I want to talk to you about how we develop fearless faith in the middle of uncertainty. And, and, and in order to do that, I want to give you prayer points. Because in order for us to take that step into the unknown, into the uncertain, or to truly rely on God, then we have to be people who pray. Do you agree? We have to be people who desire to seek after God, desire to go after Him. So 
I want to give you some prayer points that are going to lead us to victory, that are going to help us hit that, that bullseye. I've told you, and maybe if you've been here for any length of time here at River of Life, I've opened up to you and shared with you that one of the things that I struggle with is fear. And I, I'm, I'm, by and large, a, a visionary. And so sometimes I have so much that I feel the Lord is wanting to do, I can become anxious, I can become overwhelmed. And what I love about Joshua is as he fixes his attention on God, and we're going to talk about this this morning. You know what? In chapter 1 and chapter 2, God has to tell him over and over again, Joshua, fear not. Joshua, fear not. Joshua, you can do this. Joshua, I'm not going to leave you. Joshua, take courage. Joshua, be encouraged. Joshua, don't fear. And then in chapter 6, through the end of the book, not one time do you see the word fear and Joshua together. Something happened. Something took place. And I, and I believe as we look at these three, three prayer points, this is what took place in Joshua's life that allowed him to truly focus and hit that target. And you know what? He never looked back. You say, Dale, how do you know that? Because when you go to the end of this book, Joshua, as things are falling off around him, when, when even his closest friends or people in Israel begin to worship other gods, they begin to lose heart in God. They begin to get overwhelmed with the status that was going on in their nation. And they turn from God. And you know what Joshua said? Joshua said, listen, guys, I just want to tell you something. As for me and my heart, I got my eye on the target. I got my eye on the bullseye. And for me and my house, here's what we're going to do. We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be fearless. I started long ago, and I'm not stopping now. And that's my prayer for us. That's my prayer for this, this church. So the first prayer point that I want you to see is this. We need to pray, God, allow me to see the situation like you see it. God, allow me to see the situation like you see it. And before we move on, I'm going to tell you how we're going to end this service. And this is very important. So this is why I want you to really hone in on these prayer points. As we talk about Jericho, many of you know the story. Some of you may not, but it was an overwhelming task. And they obeyed the Lord. They marched around the city. They blew the trumpets. And the walls fell down. So as we go through the word of God today, I'm going to, at the end of this message, what we're going to do is we're going to stand and we're going to pray for two minutes. And we're going to, I'm going to show you what we're going to pray. We're going to pray these three prayer points. After that, we're going to blow the shofar. And as that shofar blows and you hear it, what we're going to do after that is we're going to worship. We're not going to shout, as in just shout to shout. It's going to be something different. It's going to be, we're going to honor who God is. And I'm going to talk about that. And as you do that, whether you're in your seats or you come to this altar, I'm believing that God is going to speak to me. He's going to speak to you. And those walls, whatever is happening in our in our lives or whatever we're facing, we're going to see God in it. Amen? So first prayer point, God, allow me to see the situation how you see it. Look at it. In Joshua chapter 5, first in verse 13, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and he looked. It, it, it would appear that Joshua was trying to decide in his mind how he could take Jericho. So he's walking around, he's looking, he sees the city. He knows that it is a fortified city. It's the third largest city in Canaan. Powerful city. More powerful than, than Joshua and his army in Israel. 
And all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord comes and, and he sees him and he asks, are you for us or against us? And he says, neither. And he says, I just need you to obey. I just need you to worship. And I believe Joshua was seeking God's direction. He was seeking the Lord. He was looking for an answer on what to do. The Bible tells us he lifted up his eyes. And so the first key to victory is we just have to take time to look. To allow the Holy Spirit to show us. To allow the Holy Spirit to direct us. To give us a proper perspective in our situation. I believe Joshua was asking God to give him divine insight. And that is what we need if we are going to be fearless. That is what we need if we are going to conquer the impossibilities in our lives. We have to hear from God. It has to be something very supernatural. God opened our eyes last week in chapter 5. And we we saw that in chapter 5 they were... They were in preparation. They were waiting. They had to have God and the Holy Spirit work on their hearts in order for them to even get an understanding about what was going to happen in chapter 6. And so Joshua looked up and he's trying to get God's perspective. A parallel passage to this, which it kind of opens up what really is happening here, is in 2 Kings chapter 6. In 2 Kings chapter 6, Elisha is is on the run from a king who wants to kill him and destroy him because God was using Elisha to, to mess with this king's mind. And so look at it in verse 15 in 2 Kings. When the servant of the man, this is Elisha's uh, a partner, Elisha's servant, associate, The servant of the man of God arose early in the morning and went out, and behold, an army with horses and chariots were all around the city. And the servant said, my master, what shall we do? You can see and sense the fear in this guy's voice. He goes out and he sees the king's army. He knows that him and Elisha are are dead men. And watch what happens. It says this, then Elijah prayed, O Lord, Please open his eyes. God, help him to look up. God, give him a perspective. I see what's happening. You've shown me, but you need to show my friend. You need to give him the perspective that he sees something that is supernatural. Help him look up. Help him open his eyes. Here's what happened. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. In other words, he now saw God's army all around Elisha, which was greater than the natural army. So he got God's perspective, and when he got God's perspective, it changed the situation. Do you see what I'm saying? And one, one author, Gene Getz, said this, Only those who see into the invisible will be able to attempt the impossible. It's interesting, before Joshua ever did a thing militarily, and he was a military genius. He was a military genius. That's what he was trained for. So before he did that, before he took matters into his own hands and operated in his own giftings and operated in his own strength, he first looked to God. And I'm not sure where you're at this morning. Maybe today you are in a chapter five moment where God is preparing you. You're in a time of preparation. You may not know how to handle the situation you're in, but God is preparing you. And if we are going to accomplish the impossible, we first must see the invisible because God does have a plan. God does have a purpose. God is in control. God will help us. But the first thing we need is a vision to see the situation like God sees it. Joshua took time before the Lord and the Lord provided an answer. But he didn't get that answer 
immediately. And so he kept seeking. He kept listening. He kept asking. I don't know about you, but many times I have prayed and I've not heard an answer. And sometimes it's frustrating. Say, God, how come you're not answering? And many times, again, we're in that preparation time where God is trying to change our perspective so that we can enjoy that blessing. Now, this is not the first time that Joshua sought God sought God's wisdom concerning this this ominous problem in conquering Jericho. All the way back in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1, it says this, And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go, view the land. Watch this. Especially Jericho. Why? Because Jericho is on his heart. God, how are we going to do this? How can we conquer this place? God, it's too powerful. They're too big. I, I, I'm afraid. I don't know what to do. I've never dealt with anything like this before. God, I just don't have the manpower. Notice that God waited until the moment he was ready for Joshua to act before he answered. If, if you're facing a difficulty, don't get frustrated if God hasn't answered you on the first time out. Don't get frustrated if you say, well, I I went to the river night of prayer and I was there at prayer and I was obedient and you still didn't answer God. I've been waiting a month. I've been waiting a year. I've been waiting 10 years and 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 I haven't heard you answer. Listen, know this, that he does care. He does love you. Our responsibility, our responsibility is to keep looking towards Jesus Christ. When we keep looking towards Jesus Christ, then we have our eyes fixed on the target, fixed on the bullseye. Keep looking because we don't know the day when God is going to act, when God is going to speak, when God is going to answer. And it doesn't mean that the answer may be what you're even asking because he's preparing you. He's getting your heart ready to accept the answer, to, to really believe in what he is trying to do. So, so Joshua keeps seeking God. When I look at his life and look at the story, I would think that when, when Joshua crossed the Jordan, Joshua probably thought, well, now I'm going to get the answer because something supernatural happened. Now he's going to tell me because I know Jericho is, is intimate, but he didn't get the answer. You would think in chapter 5 when, we, when, when he obeyed God and they consecrated themselves before the Lord and we talked about that last week where there was some cutting away and they cut away things of the heart and we laid them before the Lord and he said, God, okay, I've, I've asked for forgiveness. I, I cut this out of my life. I cut this out of my life and now you're going to answer and now I'm going to get the prize. It didn't happen then think well Passover is so special it's going to it's going to happen then God's going to speak to me after we take Passover but it didn't happen and maybe some of you are feeling you know what Dale right now I'm telling you Dale right now is the time for God to move he's going to answer me now can I just encourage you the issue is not so much that God moves on our behalf this instant as it is that we keep our eyes on God and ask him to show us in the spirit where we are at God show me where I am at show me my heart the Bible says that that we can't even know our own heart that only God knows so we need his perspective do you agree we need his perspective God give me your perspective and the grace to trust in you And he will answer us in the time that will be perfect, in the time that we will be ready, and it will be a moment when we have total victory. There's a second prayer point that we need to pray in order to gain that victory and hit that target. We need to pray this. God, give me a peace in my heart at every single checkpoint along the way. At every stage in my life, God, as I go to you, you confirm. You confirm, you give me that peace 
that goes beyond understanding. As I continue to, to go to you, help me in this way, God. So when we face impossible situations, we know that God will show us what we need to do and give us that supernatural peace at the same time. That's why we are praying Isaiah 41.10. Be not afraid. Don't fear. I am with you. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to uplift you with my righteous right hand. And Joshua prayed. And God laid out a strategy. And it was step by step. Every checkpoint. Look at it in Joshua chapter 6 and verse Three. Here's what you're going to do. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Okay, take up the Ark of the Covenant. You remember that symbolizes the presence of God. And let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the Ark of the Lord. So as you take a look at this, the first step, the first checkpoint is it was a spiritual strategy that God gave him. He tells Joshua to march around the city 13 times. Now I want you to see the key element in this master plan of God. First, silence. Second, shout. Third, sound the shofars. That's it. That's the big plan. I mean, I believe when you really look at this, I believe it indicates that victory would be won first on a spiritual level. So so isn't that the truth for all of us as well? Most of our victories are won in prayer. They are won in the spirit before they are ever won in the natural. If we don't win it in the spirit, we'll never see the victories in the natural. So as we look to God, we need to seek him. And then we see that victory. Look at Peter when he's walking on the water. It was miraculous, but he took his eyes off the bullseye. The bullseye was Christ. And and he took his eyes off, he sank. You look at Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. It's a parable that teaches us to pray and what? Never give up. Continue to pray at every checkpoint. Because often the enemy wins the battle of the mind when we stop prematurely. And we get our our eyes off the target, off the bullseye, and we think we're so accurate, but we're hitting the wrong, we're not aiming at the right target. And we stop prematurely. No longer are we fearless. No longer are we trusting in God. No longer are we being obedient to the Lord. We're doing it on our own power. And that's why Ephesians chapter 6 is is so very important when it talks about spiritual warfare it says in verse 10 finally be strong in the lord and and in his strength put on the whole armor that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil and so part of that armor is is our spiritual foundation we get that through prayer look at it in verse 18 here's what he says praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end keep alert with all perseverance making supplication to all of the saints in other words he's saying pray 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 get that spiritual strategy first humble yourself before the lord first not so that we can get god's attention but so god can get our attention god already knows but he's he's working in us. So the battle is one in prayer. And that's why here at River of Life, if you were here at the beginning of the year and we talked about our values, this is a major value for River of Life. We have to be people of prayer. 
seeking the heart of God through prayer, worship, and fasting. That is where our strategy starts. That is our spiritual foundation. And listen, I know you can pray at home and of course fast at home and give honor to God at home. Absolutely, we should do that day in and day out. But once a month, we come together corporately. And it's a value that we have. We meet on Friday nights for prayer from 7 to 8.30. Pastor Jacob leads that time. So it's important We have to start the strategy with the spiritual foundation first. Then I want you to see the physical part. It was a physical strategy. While God was going to work a miracle, he wanted his people to be all in, completely involved physically. You say, Dale, what do you mean? In verse three, he tells them, I want you to march. So I want you all to do that. In verse five, he says, when they blast and make the sound with the ram's horn and you hear that, then all the people are going to shout and give praise and worship to God. Then this is going to happen. Are you following me? So they were all in. And, and my experiences have been in, in, in my life as we look at this thing that we call Christianity. When God desires to tear down the Jerichos of life, he wants us to be involved. He wants us to be listeners of his voice. He wants us to be passionate about his word and read the word of God. And not just read it, but do it. Not just listen, but hear and then act. Are you following me? Where we are all together, he desires us to obey his word. So today, when we give God our Jerichos, And I ask for two minutes of of silence to pray. Don't be surprised when the Holy Spirit asks you to be a part of the solution. Don't be surprised if he asks you to do something. So we have to see ourselves as part of the miracle. See ourselves as part of the solution. I think in terms of river of life. Is God raising this church up? Yes, I believe he is. Does God want us to be men and women who are fearless in our faith? Yes, I believe he does. Does that mean we're just gonna listen to a bunch of messages on faith and or on fearless and have no responsibility? Absolutely not. One of our values, again, is that we are all in as a church. And we talked about this value. Wholehearted teamwork excuse me, Woo, that, that, did that hurt your ears? I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about that. Um, and, so, and, and so we have to be all in. God is desiring us together as a church to do something because God's ultimate plan is to develop us, to help us, to strengthen us, for us to be fearless. That's why in Isaiah 41.10, he says, listen, don't fear. I'm going to give you the strength. I'm going to help you. But you have to do something. You have to be all in. Well, there's another strategy. It was, it was totally radical. I mean, imagine how fearless their faith must have been to just walk around that city the first time. These are warriors. These are Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine guys. I mean, and, 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 and they're being told to do something that I, literally I don't know what they thought, but I mean, we know they did it. We read chapter six many times, and, and, and as believers, we were like, oh, woo, it's a Jericho moment. Praise, praise Jericho moment. And we get all, and we say, that, that's my God. That's my God. That's how he does it. Just do it, and the walls fall down. And, and we, 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 we lose sight We think it's so easy. I mean, it wasn't. This is a huge step of fearless faith. I mean, one of the principles I see in this unusual plan is we have to be ready. If we're believers in Christ, we have to be ready. When we face impossibilities, we need to keep our eyes, our ears, and our minds open to what the Lord is wanting to do. What the Lord is wanting to do. Not what we want in the situation. 
What does he want? One of the greatest challenges we face individually and as a church is to be sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit not to fall into a rut by looking at other people. Well, God healed her. Why isn't he healing me? If he's the same God, why did God do that financially for them and didn't do it for why is God giving them the answer why is God blessing them and not me why why is God doing that for that church but not for my church and we get our eyes off the prize off the target off the bullseye we do that not only by seeing and and looking at other people we do it also in looking at other churches Listen, I'm not concerned what a church in New York is doing. I'm not too concerned what a big church in Florida is doing or North Carolina is doing. I am concerned what the Holy Spirit wants to do in this church. That's where our focus has to be. That's what we have to think. That's where we need to set our minds, and that's what I have to do for my own life. Listen, I feel we need to pledge ourselves to say, God, whatever you want to do in me, God, whatever you want to do here at River of Life, and that's where I am, then we are going to do it. We're all in. Then we begin to see what God really wants to do. Because why? We're taking responsibility. And then God says, listen, if you're ready, it's it's going to be radical. Not radical just to be crazy. But if it's radical and God's in it, I'm all in. But we got to know if it's God. Well, then I want you to see it was simple. I love, I love, I love this because our God is not complicated. Here's, here's of all my education, (laughs) not saying that privately, but all my education, so let's, you know, I'm gonna give you wisdom here that I spent all this money to get. Here it is. Two things that you have to do to be victorious and fearless. Ready? I mean, you all should be having paper and pen out. I mean, that cost thousands and thousands of dollars for me to come up with it. Ready? Trust and obey. There it is. It reminds me of that song. My wife's got to kill me, but it's okay. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. To be happy, sing along, in Jesus, but to trust and obey. There it is. That is it. We trust and obey. It's simple, but so hard. I mean, God told an Assyrian general by the name of Naaman when he wanted to be healed. He said, you know what? Go jump in the, in the, in the Jordan and wash yourself seven times. That was pretty simple. Just go do that. You'll be healed. And you know why? He got mad. He said, what? That's too simple. And why is the, the, the prophet's servant telling me? I'm a, I'm a powerful man. I want a powerful man, a powerful pastor to come and tell me. I'm no punk. I don't want some pastor of, pre, of pastoring 30 people to come give me a word. I want a pastor who's, who's, who's preaching and teaching 30,000 to come give me a word because I'm somebody. And, 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 you know, he got upset because he thought it was going to be complicated. He thought it was going to be a big deal. I mean, God, God told the blind man, Jesus said, hey, go wash in the pool and you'll be healed. God told the lame man, hey, get up and walk. That's pretty, that's pretty simple. He told, he told Mary Magdalene, hey, listen, you know what? You're sleeping with all these people. You're having sex with everyone. Here's what I want you to do. Stop having sex with people you're not married to. Do you think that's pretty simple? God, what do I do? Hey, get up, go sin no more, stop committing adultery. You know what? She became one of his most most valued disciples. He told his disciples, hey, take a piece of fish and a piece of bread, go feed all these people. Wait, wait, that's, I got, that, that's too easy. No, just go do that. 
I mean, we serve a simple God. And you know what? How do I know that when it comes to salvation? He says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's it. It's simple. Simple, yet many times that simplicity escapes us. Because when it comes to doing something complicated, you know, in reality, it doesn't take much faith. You know why? Because if it's so complicated, usually 98% of it is done by us and our talents and our giftings and our own efforts and 2% God is doing when it really should be the opposite. We trust and obey something that we cannot do on our own and then God puts it all together. When, when Tawan was doing this video and I talked to him before, he was scared to death. Talk about a man in fear. But I bet you if he talked to you, he would say these two ingredients were involved in having what came out of this. I trusted and I obeyed. Oh, look at that. Did you see that? I didn't even plan to do that. Trust, obey, two thumbs up. So that's, that is... Um, that was not even, my, I was like, wow, God, you're pretty cool. That, that, that was a great illustration. So it's so simple, but it takes faith. Listen, it takes great faith to do simple things. It takes great faith to do simple things. Dip in the pool and you'll see. God may be saying to you, hey, forgive that person who hurt you, who scarred you, and you will be set free. You want me to do what? Just go ask for forgiveness or go forgive them. Don't have anything ill in your heart. So simple, but how many of you know that's so hard to do? So we walk around in bitterness, anxiety. Hey, just, you need to stop doing that and I'm gonna help you to stop it. That's how simple it is. I mean, then, then when we come to Jesus Christ, he will forgive our sins. He'll save us from our sins. It's so simple, but it takes faith. To trust and obey. Well, the last thing is it was, a, it was a focused strategy. I want you to notice what Joshua says in Joshua <clears throat> chapter 6 and verse 2. Or what God says, excuse me. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given you Jericho into your hands. Even though there were seven cities that they had to face, and they didn't know when they were going to face them, they didn't know how, he only told them about at this point, one city, and that was Jericho. You know, God doesn't always spell our lives out for us. He takes us one step at a time where we trust and obey and we stay focused. So in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34, Jesus says, hey, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. God deals with us in a very focused way. He does not lay it all out for us. And don't ask him to because we will frustrate ourselves wanting him to do it and then we'll get mad at him like Naaman did. And, and it's not God's fault. I mean, after 24 years of ministry, listen, I'm finding out that all I want is for God to help me and speak to me today because I can do nothing I'm finding out about tomorrow. So I'm trying hard, desperately to focus and say, God, I can handle whoever, who am I meeting today? Who am I counseling? What are you telling me? What am I reading? What, what do I need to prepare for? so that I have a, give my, that person I'm talking to my full attention. I'm not four days ahead. It's hard. You know. You're there. You, that happens to you. God, you're putting so much in me. How can I tackle it? It seems so ominous. God, what are you doing in our church? What are you doing in me? What are you doing in my family? What are you doing for the future? One day at a time. Trust and obey. Do not fear. I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you. Well, the last prayer point is this. We need to pray, God, 
Let the victories in my life bring you glory. Joshua chapter six and verse 15. It says on the seventh day they rose early and at dawn they marched around the city. It was only on that day they marched around seven times. Watch this. And at the seventh time when the priest blow, blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. They gave God the glory. They honored God. Joshua chapter six and verse 20. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout and the walls fell down. Now, what's happening here? God is asking the people, I want you to give me praise. You say, Dale, what do you mean? God is saying, I want you to honor me. In verse five, we see that word again, shout. And the word shout can be used in two ways. In a verb form, it can mean war cry. And usually it is in a verb form. In other words, you know, if you have ever been in athletics or you're pumping yourself up, you're getting ready, and these soldiers are like, you know, you're like, gosh, come on. Let's get on, let's kill these guys. You know, you're, it's a war cry. It's just, a, it's, it's just noise. It's pumping you up and getting you all fired up to do something. But that's not what worship is. Are you following? That's not what worship is. And, and in a noun form, this, this word shout is used as a call to worship. In other words, honoring who God is. Giving God glory. It's an attitude of triumph, of victory, of joy. Giving God the glory. And you know how it's used in Joshua chapter 6? You know what form it's in? Noun form. It's a call to to honor it's a call to worship you see this this word over and over again in the psalms psalm 98 4 make a joyful noise unto the uh, to the lord all the earth break forth into joyous song and sing praises psalm 98 6 with trumpets and sounds of the horn make a joyful noise before the king of kings in psalm 47 47 1 it talks about giving worship to God and letting him give you the victory and to honor God for who he is you say Dale why would God call them to worship before they ever took the city notice in verse 2 when you read Joshua it says and the Lord said to Joshua see I have already given you the city it hasn't even been the end of the chapter did he know when no he just had to obey. He had to trust. So it's not just a declaration of praise. The shout is the means by which the walls fall down. So God said, I want you to engage in your faith so much into what I am doing to give me honor. So the first lesson God teaches Israel in the promised land is to be fearless, to trust and obey. To, to do something they never thought they would do, to march, to honor him, to worship, to blow the trumpets. And as you believe in me, worship me. Or you can say this, if you believe I'm your God and you trust in me, then obey me. If you trust in me, honor me, worship me. Some of you are here in circumstances right now and God is saying, worship me with a shout of triumph and I'm gonna help you. See, worship, true worship, is ascribing to God his true nature. In his nature, he is mighty. He is a great God. He is a righteous God. He is a loving God. He is a merciful God. He, he is a all-knowing God. He is a God of justice. And so here is, here is Jericho, and he's saying, when you honor me, you can do this only because I am going before you. So when we realize who God is, the questions of then, am I going to fail? Has God abandoned me? What's my future going to be? What's my chapter six look like for me? When am I going to get chapter six? When am I Jericho's got to fall? Those aren't the questions we need to ask. 
All we do is honor God. We trust and obey. And God is saying, just worship me. Just look up. And the result is going to be this. When something stirs in you, faith that is as small as a mustard seed, then I am going to be present. And when I am present, then things are going to fall. Things are going to work. I'm going to speak. And so we trust and we obey. Let's stand to our feet, church. Amen. I want to do what we said we were going to do. And these three prayer points, I want us to really let them stir our hearts. We're going to take two minutes to pray. And I believe God has spoken to my heart. I want it to be silent. I don't want anyone given a word because God is talking through his spirit as we are still before him. Two minutes of silence. It's got to seem like 20 minutes. But I want you to pray. I want you to seek after him. I want you to say, God, I'm listening. Then you're going to hear the shofar blow. And and after the shofar blows, I've asked Pastor Amanda and the band, we're going we're gonna to worship. We don't necessarily have to just shout after the shofar, but we need to begin to cry out to God. And you know what they shouted? They begin to shout out the character of God, who God was. They begin to honor God. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for being omniscient. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your justice. Thank you, dear God, that you sent your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my salvation. God, I honor you. God, I praise you. God, speak to me. God, help me. And as we do that, you just begin to worship, and I'm praying that God is going to speak, that God is going to give you direction. That God had maybe just open your eyes. Maybe just step one is for you to at least see the target. God, just show me the target because I'm so lost right now. Give me something to focus on. That may be him answering you, right? That may be the beginning. 